John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Does this create any problem for the Trinity? Absolutely not. This is a comforting statement to Mary Magdalene. Woman, why are you weeping in verse 15? He is comforting her. He's bringing her joy. He's ascending to be with the Father in heaven. There's, there's no longer going to be pain and persecution. He's going to be with their God and his God. Yes, they're going to the God and Father. He's tell, he wants to comfort the brothers as well. You see, their brothers spiritually and in humanity, they have the very same God, absolutely, because Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the brother of God's people in that sense. In Hebrews chapter 2, he's described as our brother. In other places, he's described as our brother. He's the son of God. We are the children of God. And in that sense, we can call Jesus Christ our brother in the faith. He's the firstborn in the sense of receiving the first and ultimate inheritance of God's kingdom, a double portion according to Old Testament law. Of course, Jesus Christ had a God. You see, if God would appear in human existence, would we expect that person to be an unbeliever who rejects God? If the Word who was God became flesh and dwelt among us, in that flesh, in that humanity, would that person be a rejecter of God? Of course not. You see, Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to believe in God, worship God, follow God, live by faith, because he was truly human. He had to be our example here to live a holy life. He couldn't be a worthy sacrifice on the cross if he was an unbeliever, if he rejected God, if he was too arrogant to regard his Father as his God and follow God and worship God and obey God. He had to obey all righteousness to be a holy and worthy sacrifice on the cross to take away our sins. So. Absolutely, the, the, the brothers and sisters in and of the Lord Jesus Christ have the same God and Father. Jesus is not a separate God or another God from the Father. He is the very same God as the Father. This is the same chapter where Thomas says to Jesus, My Lord and my God. This is not OMG. This is not Oh my God in excitement as if you're using the name of the Lord in vain. This, that's a modern invention that didn't exist at the time of Jesus. Thomas is saying, literally in the Greek, the Lord of me and the God of me. The definite article was used. The God of me, the God who I have, the God that I worship, is Jesus Christ. The object of Thomas's faith is the person of Christ. Jesus says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And then he says and declares it as faith. Thomas's worship and faith as Lord and God, being Jesus being the Lord of Thomas and the God of Thomas, is regarded as true faith and worship by Jesus. Jesus doesn't rebuke it. This is not OMG. This was written for a very specific reason, to show us who Jesus Christ really is. You see, this verse is in the same book where the word who was God in, verse, in John 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse, bringing our minds to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Word who was God brought everything, absolutely everything, into existence. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, Jesus Christ became flesh as the Word who was God, who was from the Father, who was with the Father in the beginning, with God. And he's called the true light. He's not literally the light. He's not literally a light, just like he's not literally a word, but these show us who Jesus is, that he declares the Father, he's the light of the world, he reveals the truth, etc., etc. The, the Word is identified as the only Son from the Father. The word is identified as God the only Son or the only begotten God in John 1.18, who has explained the unseen Father. 
This translation says, the only one himself God. Jesus is the only one himself God. This is the same book that's where Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So he's the revelation of the Father, the declaration of the Father, equal with God. And he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. This is the same book where in John 12, 41, Isaiah saw the glory of Christ, quoting Isaiah 6, where Isaiah saw the glory of Adonai, the Lord God, on the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. Also, John 10, Jesus says, I give eternal life to the sheep. They will never, ever perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews try to kill him. They want to kill him. And Jesus says, uh, and the Jews say in verse 33, The Jews answered him, We are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And because God, you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. They interpreted him as claiming to be God. And part of the reason for that is that Jesus says in Deuteronomy 32, 39, uh, Jehovah says, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can save anyone from my hand or deliver from my hand. So Jesus says, I give eternal life. And there is no one who can snatch them out of my hand. Jehovah, the Lord God, says, I give life. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Jesus was deliberately using words from this verse, applying them to himself. These learned Jews who knew the Old Testament were, would, would be familiar with the words and then say, you are claiming to be God. You can't say those things. You can't say as a mere man that you can give eternal life and secure with perfect safety the people of God that they will never ever perish in your hand and you save them perfectly. You save them to the uttermost. You as a man, you can't say that you are one with the Father. You can't say these things without claiming to be God. Also, John chapter 8, Jesus says, Before Abraham was born, I am. And they wanted to kill him instantly because he claimed eternal existence before the very birth of Abraham, which was a thousand, two thousand, maybe more years before Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. So he's working just as the father is working. Therefore, this reason, therefore, uh, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was—he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God in a way that made him equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, no, read the whole verse, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in the same way. You see, Jesus can't do anything independent from and only by himself, independent from the Father, but he sees what the Father is doing. He does it exactly likewise. He does what the Father does. He does it in the same way. Jesus is claiming and elaborating on his equality with God himself. So. Don't just quote one verse. Read the whole book. Interpret John 20, 17 in light of the whole gospel of John, which declares Jesus is the eternal God and creator of absolutely everything, the word who was God and became flesh. In that flesh, he had a God over him. In that flesh, he worshipped the Father because he had to fulfill all righteousness as the humble servant of God, as the Messiah, as the righteous one, he had to fulfill all righteousness. God in human form is not going to be an unbeliever who rejects God. Won't He, he will be humble. He won't be arrogant, too arrogant, and then reject God. So the verse is cannot be used against the Trinity at all.